Well, first we're going to thank Braden. We have to have some train music, right? <laughs> and sometimes I'm sure for those that were a part of the derailment, they felt like they were in prison. <laughs> okay, why well, we got a Fremont High School band under the direction of Andy Schmidt. try to get my part in first. <laughs> I would like to say good afternoon to everyone and thank you so much for coming out today on behalf of Wigga Arts and Wigga Area Historical Society over there. Um, volunteers, we welcome you to this Remembrance event. We thank all of you for coming to commemorate the 25th anniversary when a freight train involving 37 cars derailed right near this very site. Most of those involved will never forget what happened after Jim Bayman Assistant Fire Chief got a call from Wapaka County Dispatch at 5.55 a.m. on March 4th, 1996 to say there was a train crash. Fortunately or unfortunately, 
Fire Chief Gary Hecker was vacationing on a cruise, so he couldn't come back. Jim took care of everything. He stepped up to the plate and he took charge. Several of the 14 tank cars hauling liquefied petroleum gas ruptured and ignited. Raise your hands if you have memories of those 18 days. Wow, yes. And I'm sure everybody has a story to tell. Without the brilliant leadership in Waiwiga at that time, who knows what would have happened. Waiwiga is a resilient community with many talented people, young and older, as we can see with the band. Talent continues. We thank Braden Grimm, hiding behind the fire truck, on his electric guitar and members of the Waiwiga Fremont Band under the direction of Andy Schmidt for sharing music today to be uplifted. You will be hearing short remembrances today from three people that were very much involved in the whole derailment event. Judy Wiesman, Jim Bayman, and Tom Cullen. Now I have the distinct privilege to introduce to you the only female ma mayor that the city of Waiwiga has ever had. She did an outstanding job in every aspect during the derailment. Let's put our hands together for the 1993 to 1997 mayor, Judy Wiesman. Thank you, Mary. You are a true advocate of Waiwiga. And thank you, Ian and Kathy, for your interest in this story. I'm very pleased to, I was very pleased to be asked to speak to you today. And chronologically, I'm really pleased to be here. <laughs> People always seem to know where they were on 9-11 when the towers were hit. But where were you when you first heard about the derailment? Everyone has a story about that day and beyond. Most likely, like me, you were still in bed around 6.45 a.m. We lived on 2nd Avenue, just a couple of blocks over here. And the booming noise made me bound out of bed and look out the bedroom window. I told Ron, my husband, the co-op blew up and all I saw was orange fire. I was a photojournalist for the Post Crescent back then and in the newspaper business for about 25 years. We quickly dressed, I grabbed my camera, and we made our way to the phone, because it was dark, to call the Post Crescent to tell them what I thought I saw. We drove to 3rd Avenue, which is the street right over here, and to the scene right here that I found to be unbelievable. I started snapping pictures, but it was dark with little hope of capturing what we were really seeing. It looked like someone had piled up toy train cars and then set them on fire. It was very, very scary. Normally, I'd get closer to the scene for better shots, but not this time. I said to Ron, I said, we're, we're getting out of here. As we crossed Mill Street, the first fire truck was coming over the bridge. And I thought, man, are they gonna have a battle on their hands? Then we saw a sheriff's squad moving on 3rd Street, 3rd Avenue, and I knew evacuation warnings were being given. We went back home so I could call the Post Crescent again to tell them what I'd really seen and to tell them to send in the troops because this was bad. Our phone was dead, no cell phones back then. We had no lights. I quickly grabbed my purse and we left for our business on Mill Street, not to return for 21 days. The first call for me came just about 7 a.m. and it was from the mayor of Wapaka asking me what kind of help we needed. I felt kind of dumb, I had little information and said I would have to call him back. 
If there was a job description for the mayor's position, I doubt if it would have included what to do when the city is totally evacuated. But that's what was happening, first north of the bridge and then south across the city. About 8.15, personnel from Wisconsin, Central Wisconsin Railroad gathered at the library with police, fire, and EMTs. It was a small group, but I'll never forget the dismal report the railroad reps gave of the situation. The danger of propane dictated that everyone must leave, but where would they go? The residents were informed by police and emergency personnel. Plans were made for the health care facility and the county hospital, and the exodus had begun for everyone. I wondered, did everyone get the message? Around 10.30, I thought about the elderly lady, three houses from ours, on 2nd Avenue. She was about 90 years old. She lived alone and was hard of hearing. I found two, Ron and I found two EMTs, and Ron asked them if they would take him over across the bridge, which we weren't allowed to do, and check her house. The door was locked, but she did respond, and she had no idea what was going on, and she was just over here two blocks. They took her to safety, and I wondered, were there more like her? I wasn't law enforcement, not an EMT, not a fireman, I was just the mayor, what to do. But my concern was for the people wherever they were. So what does a mayor do when a city is empty and secured by local law enforcement and the county sheriff's department? Plans are ma being made to strategically lo locate the command center below the hill at world-class manufacturing. The state emergency response was coming, eventually we became part of the exodus to a safer place, and for some reason, we headed to Fremont first, where there were several cars at the diner. I walked in and heads turned. When can we go home? I could not bring myself to explain what I had learned at the morning meeting, but I told everyone, look for a place to stay that night and beyond, and listen for reports. It was a very dangerous situation, don't even try to go home. Then we drove to Wapaka, where Wyoigans gathered seemingly everywhere. Again they asked, when can we go home? Eventually the public was informed, railroad personnel were bringing in experts to deal with the propane. Our firemen put in long hours, our EMTs manned the phones at the command center, our local police con continued to do what they were trained to do, and that was to protect. The state of Wisconsin sent their very best. We were all in this together. Much like the pandemic, pandemic we are experiencing today, except there were no political overtones. There was no right, there was no left. Governor Tommy Thompson came on March 6th and asked if the state could do more. Many government departments were involved in keeping us safe and the railroad officials <coughs> pardon me, informed, informed us with daily briefings. The Salvation Army and the Red Cross had immediate responses, helping feed people and keeping a list of where people were staying. They stayed with us throughout, even after our return home, with food trucks, because so many people went home to spoil food because of the lack of electricity. Now, most of you know that the news of the derailment was far-reaching. A college friend of ours was driving home from work in South Carolina and heard me being interviewed on National Public Radio. He had been in Wyoming a few times. He knew what was going on. Another, I was invited to Minneapolis, St. Paul to speak to an emergency response people. I ended up stressing one thing. If you're ever evacuated, no matter for what reason, take your pets, your pills, and your purse. <laughs> Remember the three Ps. It'll make life a lot easier even when it's hard. Ron and I were in San Francisco on a brief business trip that next August. 
I bought a morning newspaper to see what was going on. On the front page, there was the story of our derailment and our evacuation on the front page of the San Francisco Daily Newspaper. Since this is an historic day, here's a fun fact. The mayor's salary was $1,000 <laughs> a year. That changed. Uh, I'm going to conclude here if I can get my papers lined up right here. Sorry about that. I have to tell you that my faith got me and others through this time. Countless prayers went up. Even though our churches <clears throat> were locked and two of our residents passed away during that period and funerals could not be held at the churches, the need for a higher power was obvious. We returned to our homes, no matter what the condition they were in, and more important, more important, we returned to each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. It was interesting to hear it from your perspective and gives us, reminds us of what a major dramatic event this was. And now I'd like to introduce Jim Bainman, who was in charge, uh, as Mary Jane pointed out, of without really planning to be, of the entire orchestration of saving the town. Please. Thank you. Well, March 4th, 1996. Many of you here today lived through this incident and have your own memories. But here are a few things that you may not know. Things that didn't happen. 37 rail cars derailed, 14 cars containing propane. We feared that a blevy could happen. A blevy is described as a boiling liquid, expanding vapor explosion. This had happened in previous propane derailments with pieces of tank cars landing over a mile away. 14 propane filled tanks at 33,000 gallons each equaled 469,000 gallons of propane, the largest single propane incident in American history. When the explosives expert, Billy Poe, blew off the last two problem cars on the 14th day, and they had a combined total of just 13,000 gallons. The concussion was heard a mile away, and the fireball went hundreds of feet into the air. Had an explosion happened on that first morning, with all the propane cars included, it could have been 36 times greater. Also, when we contacted Billy on the 14th day, we didn't know if he could or would help us. I was told that if he couldn't do the job, our last option was to call for an aircraft strike to blow it up. Fortunately, Billy was successful. The numbers offered to me that first morning were astounding. If an explosion had occurred within 700 feet, everyone could have died. Within 1,300 feet up to Ann Street, lung damage would be sustained. Within 1,800 feet up to Main Street, extensive property damage would occur. Within 2,300 feet up to the library, human ear damage would occur. Within 4,600 feet, the top of the hill, walls would collapse. But it didn't happen. There were no deaths and only one injury reported during the 14-day fire. One person from an industrial business tripped and fell, injuring both elbows when the lights went out. 
One elderly lady did pass away during the bus ride into reentry, but this was the safest disaster in American history. The evacuation was a solid success. The entire city was evacuated in less than five hours. Many left behind their money, medicine, and pets. And soon PETA threatened to force entry into the city to retrieve the pets. But it didn't happen. We feared the use of the National Guard armored personnel carriers for the pet rescue as the site crew indicated the ground vibration could be enough to trigger an explosion. But it didn't happen. We feared that the city water system was compromised. We had to shut down the system on the sixth day due to water loss. The water pumps for the towers could not keep enough water in the system due to the leaks. The city engineers feared water line contamination and collapse due to the age of the piping. Fortunately, that didn't happen. We discovered water from the mill pond was running around the dam, eroding the foundation. The spring runoff was happening, and the dam's automatic system did not have electricity. We sent in a crew to manually open the floodgates. We set up a contingency plan to evacuate Fremont. We feared a blevy could rupture the ammonia tanks on top of Wyoiga Milk Products building over here. If the wind was out of the northwest, the plume of ammonia gas would be blown towards Fremont. But it didn't happen. We feared that the freezing conditions, with a lack of natural gas heat, could lead to much structural damage in the city. 650 customers had lost their natural gas heat. Average temperatures during the evacuation were 33 degrees high, 19 degrees low. The temperatures were just warm enough to allow most houses to remain damage free. And the temperature was just cold enough to reduce the volatility of the propane. Much damage was averted. When I look back at all the things that could have gone wrong during this incident and didn't, I am convinced that the Almighty was looking out for us. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for your dedication to excellence, to make things better in Wywiga, and helping others in other communities by the knowledge and experience gained through the Wywiga tra train derailment. You surely stepped up to the plate when you got the call. One thing Jim didn't include was the fact that there were other areas that one, I think Judy alluded to that a little bit. Um, other places around the country wanted to know how, how did it go? How did you do it so successfully? And they had a chance to go and uh, share what they knew after the fact. So now our last, but certainly not least, speaker who fought the derailment fire with all his might and natural leadership skills, the iridescent strip of his uh, Wywiga Fire Department coat are quite visible on many of the pictures of the March 4th derailment. As we see the flames that shot high in the sky, not far away, Tom Cullen was there. Again, it's a privilege for me to introduce our current dedicated fire chief, Tom Cullen. Thank you, and um, I appreciate you asking me to be here. Uh, I was asked today to speak about the differences between the fire department in 1996 and it is today. So on our department today, there are nine members who are on the department 
when a train derailed happened 25 years ago. And we sat down and discussed some of the progress the fire service has made in the past 25 years in regards to large incidents. One change of fire is fire apparatus. Just like automobiles we drive on a daily basis, our fire apparatus has went through many changes in 25 years. And currently in our station, we only have one piece of apparatus that was in service during the train derailment, and that is our backup tender that carries water. And here is our newest piece of apparatus that we currently is our first engine out to all of our structure fires. <laughs> One major change in the fire service is the way we call for assistance on large fire scenes. In the past, the fire officer would need to radio the comm center and ask for every department he would want to respond along with the type of apparatus. Today in Wisconsin, most counties are part of the mutual aid box alarm system, which is called Mavis. This is a pre-scripted system that allows each fire department to create a list of fire departments and their equipment and the order they would like them to respond for assistance. And with minimal radio communications, they are dispatched to the scene. This system is formatted to grow with the incident. So if the incident would continue to need more assistance, they have measures in place to ensure the stricken department will continue to have enough manpower and apparatus to continue without delays. Again, another change in our fire service is part of our everyone's everyday life. It is cell phones and social media. Back in 1996, not everyone had a cell phone that took pictures, much, le much less could scan and send documents in a blink of an eye. With this technology, it assists us in doing many different tasks, one of which is getting information out to the public. Here in Wapaka County, we use the app Code Red, which is a mass emergency alerting system. It allows us to send notifications through the county to residents to specific areas if they are signed up on the app. These notifications can go out in a case of severe weather or an evacuation is needed to keep everyone safe in the event of something such as a derailment or any other type of emergency. So as a community member, one important tool for you is to sign up for the Code Red app. If there is an incident or severe weather, you will be notified and instructed what to do in case of emergency. Along with Code Red services, most fire departments have a Facebook page and a website to allow for easy distribution of information. So please make sure you are part of your local fire department's social media. They will also have information there and links for use to useful sites that will help you when you're at home, work, or fun activities. In the fire service, the incident command system has always been used, but years ago it was saved for large events like our train derailment and wildfires out west. In today's fire service, the ICS system is taught and trained by all personnel, and it is implemented at every scene, large or small. Then it is scaled accordingly as the incident grows or decreases. This helps with communications on the fire scene and in turn makes the scene operate efficiently and increases the safety at the scene as well. Another very improved tool on the fire ground today is the accountability system that is required as soon as we reach the first Mavis box alarm status. With this implementation, it ensures that the fire scene will have an accountability person that will keep accountability of where all the fire personnel are assigned and most importantly, when all personnel are out and accounted for. The final question asked of me 
is, can this happen again? Well, the answer is yes. As some of you know, the train derailment in 1996 was the second train accident in Wyoiga. Back on Monday, August 3rd, 1908, there was another accident when a moving train crashed into train cars parked on the tracks. Fortunately, this incident resulted in no injuries also. In the fire service, these types of incidents are called low frequency, high risk events. And that is something fire departments discuss, have plans for, but are difficult to justify spending a lot of time and money practicing on due to the low frequency of the incidents. <clears throat> and everything I mentioned earlier allows our fire personnel to know what to do when they get called to a large event. We give them the tools and information so they can call for the needed personnel, equipment, and supplies because no fire department is capable of funding or storing the resources that a large incident requires. <laughs> So coordination between Mavis and Wisconsin Emergency Management, local fire departments like ours have the ability to call the needed resources they need f with major incidents if they would occur in our area. So with the railroad industry being a big player in the distribution of propane, crude oil, along with many other chemicals that are transported through our county, there is always a possibility for accidents that require major resources to properly control the situation. Believe me, I hope it never happens again here. But the big realistic question is not if this will happen again, it is where and when. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom, for fighting the derailment fire with the courage that you did, dedication, and determination, and leading the Wyoiga Fire Department as chief today. I would like to take this opportunity, if I can, since I have your attention, uh, for a few messages. One, don't miss the dynamic derailment display in the window of Wigga Arts and it's best seen at night because it even has lights. You would think there's a train derailed right in their windows and that's at 136 East Main and then the Wywigga Area Historical Society has a display at City Hall in the lower level and that includes some pictures and some artifacts. Uh, you may enjoy reading more of Wyoiga's history by checking out a Wyoiga Remembers book from the library. That was uh, written by Mary Wirth, Bill and Joan Mallow during our sesquicentennial. And it's still a good resource to go to to get information. Section 3 speaks of trains and the fire department that actually began in Wyoiga in 1885. If you wish to buy one, there's a sheet to sign up for that too. And just uh, for your information, if you haven't ordered a paver brick for the historic walkway to be built in Wyoiga Park this spring, today would be one of your last opportunities because we're gonna place the order so that um, the installer can have the materials he needs. And there's a card table near the back and you can find that information. If you would like to record your memories, we would love to hear them, um, especially of the derailment for future generations. That's why we're so happy to have these high school students with us today that they can hear what went on in Wyoiga 25 years ago because of course, they probably weren't even thought of at that time. So please sign the sheet in the same location as the book sign up, and then somebody will contact you. And uh, because Wigga Arts is working on a derailment film and an event for next 
March 4th, 2022, which I hope that the Wywiga Area Historical Society can work with them again. It's been a joy doing that. Um, and then hopefully the COVID-19 pandemic will also be just a memory. We all look forward to seeing you at the Wigga Arts Building with even more dynamics next year. So, um, did everybody get a sheet of a song? If you don't, maybe you could share with somebody. I don't know if there's any left, but as we say thank you to everyone who worked to keep the city from blowing up and keeping everyone safe, we pause to help our children and grandchildren remember Wywiga's history. So now I would like to introduce Twyla Alex. She is the youngest member of the Wywiga Area Historical Society. She's a freshman at UW-Eau Claire and a graduate of Wywiga Fremont High School and she's uh, with her friend, Wywiga Fremont High School senior, Hannah Tim. And I think Braden, are you going to accompany? I'll play a little bit, yeah. Okay. And Braden is going to accompany. Uh, I don't know if I even said Braden's last name. Braden Grimp? Pardon? After this. Mm -hmm. So they're going to lead us in a special song um, as the fire chief and any firemen uh, retired or current. I know we have one right here. Any other Wywiga Fire Department volunteers here? Anyway, come forward and you will be receiving uh, an appreciation plaque. But as they come forward, we are to gather. You girls want to come up? Let us join in a special song. Grab your song sheets and join us as we all sing to the tune, I've been working on the railroad with a special twist of words by our own historian, Marietta Pop. She put it together after the derailment in 1996 while waiting for a train to pass so she could get over the tracks. It was written to be dedicated in appreciation to all our brave firefighters. So if you have your sheet, do we have, are you gonna sing down there? Okay, okay, so let's see. Step up to the mic. You want to take your mask off? What? Derailed? The, the one you've been handing out? Okay. <laughs> Do you have a question? Okay. <laughs> Everybody's going to join in anyway. So, Hannah, you want to get closer to the mic? There we go. Okay. Yes, get on the right key. Uh, <laughs> start it out. <laughs> we'll join in. I've been working on the railroad. Dangerous every day. You blow, tanker, don't you blow, tanker, don't you blow sky high. For later, if you blow, wiggle, whistle, go. Draining bird. 
going to make a presentation to the Wiwiga Fire Department. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank everyone that was able to make this happen, especially the Wiwiga Area Historical Society as well as the Wiga Arts. It is amazing to see the history of this town remembered. Um, many of us here, including myself and uh, many of the band members, were not alive for this. So it is very interesting to see the heroism that occurred with these people specifically. And we're just really proud to be a part of something like this. And we are very grateful for all that these people did. And today I will be specifically thanking the Wiwiga um, Area Fire Department. And we would like to give you this plaque to thank you for all of your service and 25 years ago and especially now. So thank you very much. So we are now going to be singing um, God bless Waiwiga, and we'll sing the first verse, and then we'll do that after the black band. One more number. Just kidding. One more number from the band. Thank you. Sorry, Black.
going on before. We're going to conclude. It's probably a good time to conclude because as the sun goes down, the temperatures go down. So we're going to conclude this time of reflection and thanksgiving and song led by Twilight, Hannah, and Brayden. And they will sing the first verse and you all are invited uh, to sing the second verse and you'll know these words. <laughs>